Okay. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Piero Scaruffi. I'm sure most of you know me. Uh, this program is sponsored by the Stanford Deans of uh, Engineering, uh, Humanities and Sciences and Medicine, by Chemical Engineering and by Continuing Studies. LASER stands for uh, Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. It's a program that has been going on since 2008. Uh, now takes place uh, uh, in more than uh, 40 universities worldwide. <clears throat> and uh, as the name says, the aim is to uh, do things uh, as inter interdisciplinary as possible. If you go to lasertalks.com, you can see the, the past programs and you will see that we've had uh, speakers from uh, all sorts of disciplines, from architecture to history, of course, lots of artists, lots of scientists, but uh, in many, many different, uh, coming many different uh, varieties. Um, <clears throat> so go to lasertalks.com if you want to know more about this. Uh, you should go also to lasertalks.com if you want to know uh, more about the speakers. Uh, my introductions are notoriously brief, especially when we do lunchtime uh, events. Um, uh, so it will be even briefer. Um, Kafka died 100 years ago. That was my excuse uh, for uh, doing something about Kafka. Originally, I invited uh, uh, Professor Korngold, and, and then the idea came to invite people who could give uh, uh, more about the background of when, uh, when Kafka was alive and more about his impact on, uh, on today's uh, uh, world, today's intellectual world. Um, <clears throat> so briefly, um, uh, Professor Stanley Korngold uh, is, uh, is a world uh, expert on Kafka. He has written and uh, translated, um, and I'll say more later. Uh, Ken Crimstein, uh, I know him as a cartoonist of the New Yorker magazine. Then I see that you've done a lot more than that. Um, and um, Claire Pentecost as a media artist, Emeritus at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, these are three independent talks. Uh, I will introduce each one separately. Um, and then we'll have question and answer after each talk. Uh, you're welcome to post uh, questions, uh, ideally under the questions, not under the chat, so I don't have to, to check two things at the same time. Um, and... Um, and that's it. If you want to know what's coming next, go to lasertalks.com. Uh, I will not spend too much time publicizing the rest of the program. Um, very good. So we can go ahead with uh, uh, Stanley Korngold, um, uh, professor of German and comparative literature emeritus at Princeton University. Um, uh, has published extensively on his work. Uh, including several translations, most recently uh, Expeditions to Kafka. Um, in 2009, he co-founded and directed the Princeton Kafka Network with Oxford and uh, Humboldt Universities. And if you know, want to know more, again, go to lasertalks.com and you'll find not only a longer biography, but also a link to a website. Okay, it's all yours. Okay, I ask the other speakers to mute and kill your video because this maximizes bandwidth and I'll do the same. I'm not going away. I'll be listening. If you know anything, let me know. The podium is yours. Stanley? Oh, fine. So thanks for this opportunity to uh, talk to you and Ken and Claire and viewers about Kafka. Um, an essay in last week's Town Topics of Princeton Gazette begins on target, quote, this is an anniversary year for Franz Kafka, who died on June 3rd, 1924, a doubly noteworthy centenary given the immensity of the author's posthumous presence which suggests that if ever a writer was born on the day he died, it was Kafka, end quote. 
My talk for today is titled Kafka in 1924, a year of his centenary, but given that, quote, immensity of presence in my 20-odd minute curfew, I won't be able to convey the full measure of that presence, but I will attempt to get to its core by example. The core being the difficult beauty of Kafka's writing, a beauty that is full of thought and which has inspired, as you know, a great variety of attempts to understand it. For Theodore Adorno, in a famous essay, satisfying the need to understand it is a matter of life and death. The approach I adopt, well suited to matters of life, death, and interpretation, is the psychoanalytic. And here I'll reach out to Jacques Lacan for support of what I call Kafka's rhetorical or literary unconscious. Since for Lacan, quote, the unconscious is structured like a language, a language consisting of chains of signifiers whose meanings, when obtained, vacillate, that's Lacan, vacillate with the character of metaphors. Now, it's a truth universally acknowledged that many of Kafka's vital and repeated word images arrive on the page as if unconsciously expelled. In line with his diary comment that reads, quote, in the solitude of writing, my inner self is loosening and is ready to let deeper things emerge, end quote. I want to explore the vacillating meanings of several of Kafka's privileged metaphors. They are dinarbe, the scar, ditasha, the pocket, defakir, traffic, but also meaning sexual intercourse, and der schuss, the shot, also meaning the gunshot wound, as they are linked throughout three stories, the judgment, the metamorphosis, and a report to an academy. Their coherence over time is owed, I maintain, to their enchainment in the unconscious. Kafka's devil lies in its details. I'll summarize these stories with apologies to erudite viewers who are already quite familiar with them. The judgment, um, my screen, enjoys jumping, shouldn't um this sorry. The judgment story composed on the night of September 23rd, 1912, is commonly regarded as Kafka's breakthrough to his proper writing destiny. The story dramatizes a struggle between I'm going to have to use a written text. So sorry. A struggle between a father, a certain Herr Wendemann, and his son, George. The old man appears frail, indeed senile, whereupon Georg puts his father to bed and proceeds to cover him up. The, his father, however, refuses to allow himself to be covered up in every sense of the word and rises up from the bed, a seeming giant. In his nightgown, performing a sort of wild bacchic dance, which exposes a scar of the wound on his thigh, the father attacks his son. As they seem to share the running of a business, his father declares that he, and not Georga, has all of Georga's clientele in his pocket, here in the Tasha. Georg replies, staring humorously at his father's nightshirt, he's got pockets, Tushin, even in his nightshirt. This remark could seem feebly playful enough, but not when one considers, as do Kafka, his German readers, Georg and his father, the proverbial citation of, quote, the last shirt, which has no pockets, namely the shroud. 
On Georg's lips, his father's nightshirt has become a shroud. He wishes to see his father dead. The awareness of this infamy rises to a crescendo. It is now Georg's father's turn to traffic in death and condemns his devilish son to death by drowning. Now the obedient son, Georg embraces the verdict, accepting a dire punishment for his parasitical fantasy and even appearing to be grateful for it. Racing to the river, that flows through Prague, the Viltava, the Moldau. He lets himself drop into the water, which reads like a Dionysian fusion with an elemental world. Accompanying his fall is the famous sentence that concludes the story, quote, at that moment, the traffic going over the bridge was nothing short of infinite. I'll begin with the one traveling metaphor, the pocket, which takes us from the judgment to its sequel, the metamorphosis. The metamorphosis enriches the meaning of this pocket metaphor, which as you've heard, is linked to a parasitical fantasy and the shroud imputed to Georg's father by Georg. You know the plot of Metamorphosis. On a rainy day, a certain Gregor Zamsa wakes to find himself in his bed metamorphosed into a giant verminous beetle. After the initial shock, he struggles to regain his equilibrium. The family, failing to call for either a locksmith or a doctor, opens their door to the office manager, who is very angry with an employee whom he suspects of malingering. Gregor's sister Grete assumes the care of her unfortunate brother, but then growing bratty becomes impatient and bored. Gregor's father, Herr Zamsa, who, like Georg's father in the judgment, abhors his son, takes his revenge, bombarding him with small, hard apples. Wounded, Gregor crawls back into his room and meekly, tenderly dies, whereupon the family celebrates its liberation by going on a picnic. Okay, we want to take special note of the small, hard apples fired by Herr Zamsa into the back of Gregor, his emasculated son. A great deal of libidinous hay has been made of this scene in which one of the apples that, quote, literally forced its way into Gregor's back suggests for some a homosexual wish dream for intimacy with a father. But here I want to concentrate on one detail regularly overlooked. These apples are small. They need to be small enough to fit into the pockets, the tushin of Herr Zamsa, the father of metamorphosis. Or should we also say of Herr Benderman, the father of the judgment. Recall once more Georg's cruel rejoinder to his father in the judgment. Even in his net night shirt, he has pockets. The implication is the son's view of this night shirt as a shroud. It is parasitical, horrible, and so goes a long way toward explaining the father's verdict. Pockets, tushin, then becomes a sort of mnemonic in Kafka's unconscious supermemory for violence aimed by the son at the father. Wouldn't the day of reckoning when Gregor Zamsa awoke one morning, his hideous verminous shape, a reproach to his family, wouldn't that aggression call for punishment along the trace line of the pocket? Wouldn't it be exactly right for the father to turn the pocket to his advantage, the pocket that in the judgment marked the peak moment of filial aggression. Now, by packing it with small hard apples, a rhetorical ballistic reservoir. The text reads, quote, for the father was determined to bombard him. He had filled his pockets from the fruit bowl on the buffet 
and was now pitching one apple after another. Why otherwise fill his pockets? And so the last shirt is contrary to all childish expectations, not the shroud, but the father's newly acquired bank uniform. And what has daddy got in his smart blue uniform? Pockets, full of an odd clientele, murderous family metaphors. Some readers have preferred to think of this patriarchal bombardment as an Old Testament stoning, or as the original Apful War, the Apple Toss, the epistemic disaster following Eve's temptation by the serpent, and hence, quote, quote, an ironic allusion to the expulsion from paradise. But that is really vague stuff and not the crux. The key word, once more, is Amstis pockets. We need to perform a Copernican turn and consider that the fruit is what it is, small apples, crab apples, in order to fit comfortably into the latter's pockets. The latter, as we know, is a Kafkian meme for intergenerational violence, stressing Georg Benderman's uh, vicious comment to his father. And now in the metamorphosis, one story we remove, we have the father's revenge. There's more. We have heard about the apple that literally forced its way into Gregor's back. Quote, Gregor tried to drag himself away as if the startling, unbelievable pain might disappear with a change of place, but he felt nailed to the spot and stretched out his body in a complete confusion of all his senses. I'd like us to reflect on this startling, unbelievable pain suffered from a paternal shot, which results in, quote, Gregor's serious wound, end quote. We encountered a wound in the judgment. Georg's father, his father's quasi bacchic dance in his nightgown, exposed the scar of a war wound in his thigh. His wound is an invitation to us to indent, intensify the Dionysian flavor of its story, the judgment. We have had Georg's plunge under a sexually charged bridge into the Moldau River, and will now add to the story what is called the birth mystery of Thebes, namely the rescue of Dionysus from the womb of Semele, who is fatally struck by lightning, her death provoked by Zeus' jealous wife Hera at domestic war with her husband, whereupon Zeus, the father, whom we'll now insert Georg's father, turns himself into a surrogate mother by sewing the saved fetus into his thigh and carrying it to term. Now, in at, least at, in at least one place in Kafka's manuscript of the Metamorphosis, Kafka writes Gregor as Georg, unconsciously linking the destinies of the two victims. And so I want to think with Kafka of the serious wound in Gregor's back as retaliation for the wound in Father Bendemann's thigh which we've linked in the mythic register to the birth pangs he suffered in delivering his son, Dionysus. The son, however, is no Dionysus. Georg is an anxious seeker of the Dionysian, perhaps think of his plunge into the river, but in his current guise, it's merely a treacherous, ungrateful, devilish sprig. Kafka remarked to his lover Melina, quote, it was then during one long night in the judgment that the wound broke open for the first time. Wound and wound. 
Can we strengthen this Dionysian element even further and gain some additional interpretive momentum? We can, if we will consider the conclusion of the judgment just one last time. At the moment of Georg's death, quote, the traffic going over the bridge was nothing short of infinite. The word for air means traffic, yes, but it also means the circulation of commodities, people coming together, and above all, sexual intercourse. Kafka's best friend and booster, Max Brod, reports that Kafka once asked him, without being prompted, quote, do you know what this last sentence means? And Kafka then answered his own question. Quote, when I wrote it, I had in mind a violent ejaculation. Thinking of this seemingly triumphant ejaculation, this shot, together with the wound in Father Benderman's thigh, a war wound, presumably a gunshot, we cannot but be drawn finally to a story written some five years later, a report to an academy. The narrator, a certain Red Peter, is an acculturated ape, precariously at home in the human world, but he is also the victim and martyr of two bullets. These wounds will lead to his capture and send him onto a path into human society in which we learn he will achieve, quote, the cultural level of an average European. But the correct way of naming the second of these shots is veiled in mystery. In referring to the source of the scar that the shot has left below his hip, Red Peter declares with eye-catching emphasis, let us choose here a specific word for a specific purpose, a word, however, that should not be misunderstood. And he states his choice. It is the scar left by einem frevelhaften Schuss, a profligate shot. Here are some other English words for frevelhaft, outrageous, sacrilegious, wicked, sinful, malicious, blasphemous, criminal, wanton. With this shot, I suggest, Kafka is alluding to that fateful ejaculation, concluding the judgment that announced his breakthrough to his life as a writer, the opening into a writing destiny that would forever cut him off as he would brood from, quote, all good and natural things from sex, eating, drinking, and also philosophical reflection on music. I starved, he wrote, in all these directions. I think we have here the answer to the riddle explicitly posed in a report to an academy of the peculiarly sacrilegious character of this shot, this jouissance. Had Kafka, after all, forgotten what he said of his writing in the earliest days, God does not want me to write, but I, I must. And so in this perspective, the famously sexed, ecstatic, nocturnal composition of the judgment appears as an improper, sinful, profligate bliss. And the writing destiny it announces as only the path like Red Peters, to a mediocre artistic competence. And so, to recapitulate, Kafka meant to take the judgment into the heights of literature. But the wound in the thigh of Herr Benderman that figures as the effect of another sort of shot, hence a sort of ejaculatio, Recox in foreshadowing 
the Dionysian conclusion of the story, the ecstatic ejaculation of the final fair care, Georg's plunge below a nearly infinite flow of sexual life. I say, this wound in the thigh of Herr Benderman, the father, implicates a different, a sadder literary future for its author. In a report to an academy, Benderman's, Benderman's wound resurfaces as the schuss, the shot, also into the thigh of the ape, wrote, wrote Peter, Red Peter, which inaugurates his destiny. Red Peter being, as he will have it, in Samuel, as we will have it, in Samuel Beckett's phrase, the vice exister for his author, Franz Kafka, it becomes the destiny of an only mediocre European artist. The moment conforms with Kafka's intermittent, intermittent but savage doubts about his Schriftsteller sein, his being as a writer. In closing, I'd like to invoke at least the title of Lacan's essay, The Insistence of the Letter in the Unconscious. It supports the view that the metaphorical images we've discussed are insistent signifiers enchained in a linguistically structured unconscious and their repetition with their associated meanings is made possible by their insistence. In another, finally, Lacan's text called Four Fundamental Concepts of Psychoanalysis, one hears of the impossibility of happiness, the impossibility of a unified personality, and the impossibility of a progressive synthesis of mental contents. On the other hand, in the conclusion of an older but excellent paper, Gunwaldsen's Franz Kafka and Psychoanalysis, Lacan's pessimism is subtly softened. After the sad conclusion to report to an academy, will Kafka will write on for many years more. And so Gunwaldsen concludes Kafka ultimately brought back from the unknown an assurance of guidance. He harmonized the disparate elements of his being and created for himself the spiritual conditions in which his mundane aspirations might have prospered and belatedly did prosper in a modest degree. Among his mundane aspirations is Kafka's well-attested desire to write stories deserving of publication. Such a prosperity, however modest its stature, was owed, at least in part, to Kafka's rich, pulsating unconscious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting that, uh, anyway, I'm not competent enough, but what you were saying, some of the things you were saying made me think of an Italian writer, you probably know, Pirandello. I don't know if there was any connection. But before that, um, can you say a few words about Kafka's fortune? I mean, uh, when did he become truly famous? When when did people start recognizing that he was really one of the most important writers of the century? Um, well, the myth is that he was um, a modest bureaucrat um, and an amateur writer of sorts. Um, those of those who knew who knew literature well, someone like Robert Musil, himself, as you know, a very great author, who was editing uh, Die Neue Rundschau, a journal in Berlin, continually asked Kafka for more of his work. He thought the work was marvelous, uh, but Kafka was very austere and ascetic about this whole matter of letting his work go. And if it didn't meet his demanding uh, his demands, he would not let it go. So I just want to say that he is recognized by uh, scholars, that is to say, those who really knew modern literature during his own lifetime, his continual demand for more of his work. But he comes into uh, 
world fame with his tran with the translations into English, really, by the Muirs in the late in uh after his manuscripts, the novels are salvaged by Max Brod, right? They're translated um, and begin begun to be uh, studied in England and then of course in the States. And New York intellectuals took him over. Uh, he's written about in Partisan Review uh, from the 40s on and then ever since, almost ever since then, a uh, continual amassing of Kafka of scholarship. It's said, it's rumored, I'm not sure anyone's done the exact counts, but after uh, work on, that is to say, published pieces on the Bible and on Shakespeare, Kafka comes next. Hmm. So, um, as you, the fame has been increasing. But your question was about really uh, is the work being very well known, uh, beginning to be very well known uh, in the late 20s, late 30s. He was known in France in French translations in the 40s and from then on. If I'm not mistaken, the first film uh that uh, based on a Kafka novel was Orson Welles, The Trial in 1962, right? right? Yes. And and even after that, I, I I cannot name another one. So so that's why I was asking. It sounds like, it, and also Welles obviously wasn't really into mainstream things. So uh, so was, was Kafka still uh, sort of an underground? phenomenon in the 60s or was he already no i think it was well known he was already well known no i think um sort of in and around new york that the first uh extended critical study was in the late 1940s and from then on some very big books begin to be published and um of course mostly in germany uh but then they are translated uh wilhelm emrich is translated Walter Sokel, um, his, his one very great, huge book on Catholic was never translated, um, but short of essays of his were, he taught Kafka at Rutgers and at Columbia. Um, and then a man named Heinz Pollitzer uh, wrote a, a very elegant book. Um, Kafka was written about by Hannah Arendt and others in Partisan Review. Um, but he, be, uh, as I say, his star begins to rise very formid formidably in the 1950s, mm -hmm. 40s and 50s. And another curiosity, I, <clears throat> I think it's in the letters, in the correspondence with Max Broad at some point, uh, he's disparaging towards Judaism. I think he wrote Judaism is superstition, something like that. At the same time, in the correspondence, I learned that he loved Taoism, Chinese philosophy. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about this? <laughs> uh, Kafka's uh, attachment to religion is an eclectic matter, right? Uh, he's not a systematic thinker. Um, yes, uh, he. a lot of things can be said about this. Uh, he loves to quote a Chinese poet who uh, writes a poem in which he addresses his mistress saying um, he would love to join her in the middle of the night, but he is just finishing a poem. Uh, and he needs to finish his poem. This is Kafka's argument for uh, not being suitable as a husband. He would not join the marriage bed at night. He wrote at bed. He wrote at night. Um, that's maybe a little bit irrelevant. His attachments. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to ask which religion gets um, the most praise from Kafka, there's a very good argument for ancient Greek paganism or uh, a, a religion of many gods. He talks about Greek cheerfulness, which was still possible uh, without being under the rod, the punishing rod of the Jewish divinity. 
partly incarnated in Kafka's father. Uh, um, so there are specialist pieces, no doubt, about Kafka and Chinese philosophy. You can you'll find them, <laughs> but there are also many pieces on about Kafka's Gnosticism, which I wrote about, um, and then, as I say, his paganism to board that she wrote to board. You have a question from the audience. <clears throat> Is there any affinity between the father's thigh injury and the one the biblical Jacob suffers wrestling an angel? That's that's very perceptive. Yes, it, it has been noted. Um, I can merely say I chose <laughs> the Greek myth because I... It was full of connections, right, um, to uh, this issue of paternity. Since the Greek wound, the wound in the thigh coming from the myth of Thebes, of Thebes is at once a, a womb, a wound in a womb, as uh, that other, the other womb, the wound that you describe, uh, which is, has been cited, um, probably lacks that immediate dimension of paternity, though in a higher spiritual sense, I suppose it could be thought of as um, giving birth to an, a religious commitment, a new fervor. But um, it, it's it's very in, it's very incisive of you to see that that relevance, and it has been cited. Excellent. Um... I, I would have more questions, but maybe I should ask after Ken's presentation uh, because they're about Prague. So let's see what Ken has to say about Prague. And then maybe my question will be more meaningful after your talk. Ken? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to... Okay. Uh... I'm asking Stanley now to uh, mute himself and kill his video. Maybe I can do it for you. So we give Ken maximum bandwidth. And also, let me let me read at least two lines about Ken. Um, no, no, stop video. Okay, okay, Ken. I think now we can see only you, and you should have no problems with the internet. Okay, so Ken Crimstein um, <clears throat> writes and draws cartoon for the New Yorker magazine, as well as get cartoons for Harvard Business Review and many more publications. Is there a book, by the way, of your cartoons? Is there a collection somewhere? Um, there is, yeah. It's uh, unfortunately out of print, but uh, you can look it up on the internet. Uh, it was a, it was a Jewish cartoons by the title of Kvetch's Kvetch Can. That was the collection, but uh, I have my, my uh, graphic novel biographies, which I've been doing lately. Uh, he recently embarked on a graphic narrative uh, about the uh, years in in Prague when uh, when Einstein and Prague and Kafka both live there and I I'll let him say more about this and it's resulting in a book Einstein and Kafka Land and I think it's better if I just let you talk about it rather than trying to summarize what you would say much better all yours thanks Piero I will try and summarize um the book which will be the kind of centerpiece of this talk uh, isn't actually coming out until August. Um, and this talk gave me a great opportunity to um, try and assemble some thinking. Um, multimedia examination. And, and you could say, and one of the things that Piero mentioned when he reached out was he was curious about the years 1911 and 1912. Stanley touched on, on 1924. And it is kind of amazing just at this moment to think about the fact that a hundred years, I mean, it, you know, there are people who live, there are probably, there are a lot of people, not a lot, but there are a fair amount of people alive who were alive when Kafka was alive, which is kind of amazing. That's like saying there are people alive when Shakespeare was alive, I, I, I think. So connecting to it in that way, but asking, you know, this, this talk is going to be, and I'm going to show some slides, going to be in the nature of a response uh, as a writer and an artist um, to the prompt, you know, what is, you know, Kafka, 
respond, or maybe 1911 and 1912 respond. So um, I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind tour of that. And in order to do that, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, there it is, and uh, here we go. So here we see someone who resembles Mr. Kafka and Mr. Einstein. And that's no mistake, because as I was diving into this, this period, um, there was a huge coincidence between these two uh, young men uh, who weren't really what they came to be in a very special place, which results in the book, this is the cover, coming up, Einstein in Kafka land, how Albert fell down the rabbit hole and came up with the universe. And to kind of anchor this whirlwind uh, tour uh, of Kafka's mind and what happened, there is this notion that I like, which I say geography is destiny. And what I mean by geography is more than the things we used to or supposedly took tests on in school. Where is, uh, you know, what is the capital of Idaho? Which I think is Boise, but I'm not sure. It's more along the lines of where we are in space and time, here we all are on a Zoom at this point, um, defines so much of what happens to us. So a large part of it is Prague, and I made a pilgrimage there uh, because this is where they coincided. This was a corner of the Austro-Hungarian Empire with a lot of very interesting, um, <laughs> to say the least, history and notes. So this is a photo I took when I was there. I, 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 I got to stay there uh, for almost a month during a little dip in the pandemic. I was very lucky. But this is really more the Prague that Kafka and Einstein would have seen. Um, these are from contemporaneous photographs I found from a, a really kind of interesting, strange book. Um, called There Goes Kafka, written by someone who was in his circle. So Prague is a universe really amazing. I had been there once visiting, and then I went back to inhabit. And Einstein, of course, I'll talk a little bit more about this coincidence, but there in the center of Prague, for any of you who have been there, is this astrological clock, which is really old, and really fascinating and been fixed up. And there's a character on this clock who rings the time. And I'm just talking about my impressions of this city. And I introduced the book with a little author's note, just to give you a sense of how I deal with the history. This much is true. The world changed, the universe changed, and you changed as a result of the events that follow. This much is also true. All the char actual characters depicted were alive and in Prague during the 16 months I described. This was a 16 month period that Einstein and Kafka coincided. And all of the actual events follow the sequences as recorded in letters, diaries, news stories, speeches, and personal testimonies. As for the non-actual characters and events, the ones perhaps reminiscent of a certain down the rabbit hole fantasy of the 1860s, well, who can say? So the narrator of the story uh, is the clock, is the skeleton on the clock. And he introduces uh, two anonymous people who hung out at a salon just across the Old Town Square from him. You can see it. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about that. This, this was a salon hosted by a woman with the incredible name of Berta Fanta. And it was an extraordinary uh, literary salon. And, I'll talk about that, but who were these two people who rubbed shoulders? And uh, according to a source no less august than Reiner Stock, the uh, the author of a some thousand page 
three volume biography, they definitely coincided uh, on May 24th, 1911. Uh, I know May 24th because it's my birthday, but in any case, on and on. So here's a little bit of an introduction. I haven't put the type in yet, so I'll read it. The patent clerk, as you no doubt guessed, he's Albert Einstein. But our 1911 Einstein is far from the sweatshirt sporting, bicycle riding, person of the century Einstein we've come to know and love. On the contrary, he's a 32-year-old father of three who's decided to drag his family to this provincial backwater, which I, with all due respect to anyone, is sort of the Cleveland of Europe, uh, he's to double his salary, save his marriage, and most important, to salvage his foundering scientific legacy. You see, even though Einstein can put I came up with E equals MC squared on his resume, he can't land a job teaching high school. In fact, it seems the only people who pay attention to his ideas are the ones who hate them, and with good reason. Um, his 1905 theory of relativity stands on very shaky ground, and he knows it. In short, he's a nobody. And that was pretty much affirmed when I spoke to Diana Cormus Buchwald, who's the head of the uh, Einstein Project, and asked if Einstein had a diary from 1911. And she said, no, why would he? He was, he was basically a, an anonymous, small-time professor. Um, as for the person of interest here and our rising insurance executive, uh, meet Franz Kafka, age 28. Circa 1911, far from the cockroach-crowned, hooded-eyed prophet of modern literature, whose very name has become a byword for mechanized ennui and the robotic futility of modern life. No, our Kafka is a six foot two, natalie dressed go-getter in the booming field of workers' compensation, renowned for his work ethic and even reputedly the inventor of the miner's hard hat, which is shocking, but somebody named Tima Hanu actually bothered to write a paper about it in the Journal of Occupational Medicine a few years ago. In any case, uh, terminally single, strictly vegetarian, and a fanatical pre-dawn lap swimmer. He's still living at home and let, uh, with his parents, unless you count a couple of press releases, virtually unpublished. Another nobody. And that's how some of the pages of the book <laughs> look, which is now in production. And I conclude that overview, and then I'll get into some of my response to what happened. Uh, by saying, nevertheless, by the time Einstein's train pulls out of Prague 16 months later, the physicist will have uncovered the key to what he called solving gravity, not only rescuing his legacy, but giving birth to what's been called everything from the most perfect intellectual achievement of modern physics to among the most beautiful and scientific achievements of human understanding. And Kafka, by the end of 1912, he's produced his story, The Judgment, the masterpiece that cracked the code of the modern written word, launching a body of work that Philip Roth said stands, quote, as a monument to the power of literature to transcend time and place and to reveal the hidden depths of human experience. Nobody knows quite how they did it or why, but I happen, and this is the skeleton speaking, but I happen to have assembled some pretty compelling clues. As I've said, I've seen it all. So pull up a chair and let's get ready. So what kind of things did I cover? Well, as I said, I did a pilgrimage. I had to go there. I had to live there. Uh, and Prague is such a specific corner of the universe. And here is an example of the place. This was called uh, the Unicorn Pharmacy, or the, uh, and it has a plaque to Einstein. Unfortunately, no plaque to Kafka there, although there is plenty of Kafka memorability, memorabilia all over uh, Prague. Don't worry about it. But on the second floor there, where that juts out, there was a pharmacy on the ground floor that uh, Berta Fanta's husband ran, and then she would have the salon every Tuesday night, and Kafka and Brod and the Chapik brothers and everybody else, you know, uh, Rudolf Steiner, Madame Blavatsky, you name it, Martin Buber, they'd all come through. And of course, the minute that Einstein got to town, when they found out he was a fiddle player, uh, he was pulled in. So I imagine a scene here of uh, Einstein playing the fiddle and Kafka sort of sitting by. He was evidently somewhat quiet in these evenings, but did show up. So I walked around and uh, there is the the Prague law offices and I thought the Scott, or the courts where maybe the trial or parts of it were meant to have been inspired by and a very Prague-ish sky. 
and the wires emanating from it. I mean, you, can, you can't turn a corner in that city without being just absolutely stunned. This is what Prague looked like in those days, kind of busy. Uh, you could have been lower Manhattan, could have been in New York. Uh, still kind of looks like that, not quite as busy. Pretty amazing. And there's, interesting, I just noticed this, there's the Edison Cafe on, on the left. And Edison plays a role in this story in 1911 and 1912. It's amazing, the intersection of things. These are the kind of things Kafka would have seen and Einstein would have seen walking around the city. Um, every building has a statue on the pediment and they're pretty interesting. I'll come back to that. But as I say, I'm very interested about what the greater world might have done to affect this transformation. I, I had a question, you know, a lot of questions. Cubist architecture, and there was the glorious brand new emperor train station, which has been fixed up from that same era. Uh, one of the only cities, this is now a bookstore, but you can see the advanced culture that was happening and that, that they were involved in. So here I have a, a sketch of our Kafka uh, in front of the train station, with which is glorious and been fixed up. And there you see the family Einstein coming in. But the question still, still, you know, what happened that took these two anonymous Jewish uh, smart aleck boys who incidentally, both of their fathers were named Hermann, although uh, I think Einstein's had an extra N or Kafka's had an extra N. But, you know, very, very fraught relationship with their Jewish identity too, and a very modern era. So what made the change? What, what, what happened? How did Einstein, you know, slay his dragon? And what was Kafka's dragon? Because it seems also in a, a lot, in a very lucky uh, moment, uh, 1911 and 1912 were very fertile years for Kafka as a diary keeper. Uh, so this was good. Uh, well, I call it Kafka land. So we're gonna talk some more about it. And here are just some shots of what he might've seen, you know, in town. You know, this was a fringe part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Some of the people who I spoke to there and, and make note of the, the signs, I mean, advertising had gone ape. Modern culture was, was, was coming in. Trolleys. Now, Paul is a real estate novelist who never had time for a wife. Uh, I, I dare say, uh, Pierre, this is the first time Billy Joel has been cited in one of your uh, talks. Uh, but if you substitute now Frank, which Kafka was sometimes referred to, uh, was a workers' comp insurance novelist who never had time for a wife. I don't know. Mr. Korngold, among much of the uh, research, I came across this, the office writings. Kafka's, you know, you can't be an amazing writer even if you're working in an office and, and it doesn't somehow come through. This was a shot. I don't think it's Kafka, but... Um, from a film that was made in Prague. And you get a sense of this combination of modernity and ancient thing going on. And here are factories where Kafka would go and try and save people from getting their fingers cut off. And work. I mean, workers' compensation insurance, which I had to learn about to try and figure out what was going on, was the dot-com uh, chat GPT of its time. Because as in industrialization was really taking off, you had to make sure the workers were protected. And factories were everywhere. This is from a Czech painting, Kubista. And down the rabbit hole we go. So here's, whoops. Uh, sorry, go back. Here's Einstein running uh, to catch the train to go to, uh, from Zurich to Prague. And his wife isn't happy about it. Now Kafka is a swimmer, the civilian swimming pool. Uh, it's no longer there, but this is what it looked like on the banks of uh, the Lutava or the Moldau River. And uh, he went with his father. He was a, he liked to swim. And it was really interesting, these pontoons, and spent a lot of time there. So I examined it, and you know, I called it the Pool of Tears. And here is Kafka swimming. And uh, he's thinking. I mean, I've known people who are swimmers, and... Uh, Swimmers, uh, they're pretty deep thinkers. And he's thinking reading should be upsetting. It should be disrupting. 
It should be disjoining. The reader shouldn't just witness the story. The reader has to participate in it. More than that, no, the reader has to write the story. I wish I could sleep. He, he was an insomniac. But he was trying, I think he was trying to do something with literature, with words that was beyond even literature, kind of performative. I was thinking about it this morning. It's almost as if, you know, it's almost as if any jazz musician after Charlie Parker has to play like Charlie Parker or not like Charlie Parker, but has to know about it. And I would argue, you know, any writer that has been exposed to Kafka or lives after Kafka has to has to respond to what he did. Uh oh. Move on slide. Uh oh. There we go. Cubist architecture. I mean, I had some people showing me around Prague and they were so proud of this. Um, but here you can see an example of it. That's a cubist. I mean, cubism was taking off, off in the world. Prague was very connected to Paris. That's a cubist street lamp. And as of most of Prague, it's cheek by jowl with a, God knows, a 15th century Catholic uh, church. And this is contemporaneous visual art. I'll come back to that. And modern inventions. The world was going wacky um, those years. Um, not only was there the first Indy 500, uh, the South Pole, one Amundsen made it, Bird didn't. Machu Picchu was discovered. The modern vacuum cleaner, the modern Browning firearm. Here's a, an ad for Victor record players. So this was a world bursting. Here's another thing that happened in that year because I know that they're living and there's press, there's newspapers, and these things are happening. Uh, still attracting a lot of attention, the Mona Lisa just a few weeks ago got stuff thrown at her. But, you know, here we are, September 1911. It was stolen right off the wall of the Louvre, and it may be apocryphal, but supposedly when uh, Brud and, and Kafka were doing a tour of Europe, they went and with visitors who would go to the Louvre and look at the blank space on the wall where the Mona Lisa was supposed to be if I mean if that isn't a Kafka-esque kind of an image I don't know what it is here's an image I, I thought of, of of Einstein walking and thinking with sort of a Kafka in the sky strange doings in California here's from a report from a Czech newspaper about this person named Ishii who was the last according to what they say the last Native American to wander out of the wilderness near Oster Osterville, California, and it was written up. They tried to, it, it, it was, it's a very poignant story. And of course I saw, you know, this was a contemporaneous piece from the meditations that Kafka wrote. I don't know if he directly saw this or not, but you're all, if you're not familiar with this little, you know, it's the wish to be an Indian. If only one were an Indian, ever alert and leaning into the wind on a speeding horse, always jerkily quivering over the quivering ground until one dropped one's spurs, for there would be no spurs, until one hurled away one's reins, for there would be no reins, and one barely saw the countryside before one as smoothly as a smoothly mown heath, but now without the horse's neck and head. I mean, I don't know if this was a direct response to this, but Kafka was reading a lot of pulp, or, or it was in the, the market, you know, pulp German writing or American writing of cowboys and Indians, whatever. Let's stop that. Move ahead. Here we go. So here, maybe I, I, I imagine him writing the manuscript of it, but he's it's being drawn. And Kafka, you know, there, this is taken from a famous photograph of Kafka and Broad at the pool, and he's smiling. It's an uncharacteristic. Now, I couldn't include this in, in the... Uh, uh, book per se, but it's in the diaries. And over this period of 1911, 1912, I, I call it fear of Yiddish. Um, there was a Yiddish theater troupe that came to town, um, provoking uh, some pretty nasty comments from Kafka's father. And uh, Kafka really fell into this. Uh, he went to this theater all the time. Uh, it was at a place called the Savoy Club. And I went to where it was and I imagined maybe what Kafka and Broad going there because he schlepped Broad there all the time. And then I did a chapter of, he, Kafka actually sort of dug into his own pocket 
February 18th of 1912, and puts on a, a talk, a show, to the kind of elite German-speaking Jews who didn't really want to have much to do with the Yiddish language. And uh, he puts on this talk and a famous speech, and there he is talking to them, and I imagine, and uh, he says, you're afraid. And he says, but this fear, this fear of Yiddish, uh, you wouldn't be able to bear uh, this this fear of yourself. You're afraid of yourself. You wouldn't be able to bear it without Yiddish. It's stronger than your fear. You know, we don't set out to punish you. This was an important part of his this development. More strange doings at the Louvre. There was another Louvre in town, uh, the, ca the Louvre Cafe, and still in business. And I went there. And you can see, this is where uh, Brentano uh, philosophy circle uh, that Kafka went to and his friend Broad was drummed out of for making a joke about the master Brentano. Is it Brentano? Yeah. But it's still there. And you can see the environment. And, 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 and Prague has been called a layer cake of, of different cultures. And I think this is, you know, there's so much of it. It was such a, it's a liminal space and, and, this community that, that Kafka was in and the writers, you know, cafes from Franz Werfel to um, Broad and on and on and on. Um, quite a, an amazing uh, place. I, there was a cafe Edison. And uh, in the book, uh, I did some research and Edison actually visits Prague during this period. And strangely, the only thing he wants to see, he really wants to see are the workings of the astro astronomical clock. And just give you a sense of there's the Cubist building and there are the types of buildings in the what, you know, maybe was being torn down or parts of town that Kafka would have seen. So this is interesting. This is a door on one of those Cubist buildings. And that's the old Alta Nu synagogue from the era of when Kafka would be there. And the fact that they're, they look similar with what appear to be eyes and mouths and stuff is really strange. More pictures. I mean, here's that uh, Kubista building, and there's the Deutsche Theater where Mozart premiered Don Giovanni. It was a German theater. And these are the things that he would have walked by every day. And this combination of Baroque and modern and was really quite extraordinary. Here are just some of those pediments. I mean, I don't no, when you're there and it's gray and I'm not even bringing up the old Jewish cemetery. I mean, there's something about the environment of that city, not to even talk about the literary things that were going on and his own world that you can see how it would affect him. And finally, as a cartoonist myself, often I, I uh, was a little bit struck by the fact that I think in many ways Kafka was the first modern cartoonist. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of his drawings were published last year from the disputed Max Broad uh, collections that came out. But look at some of these drawings. They're quite extraordinary. A huge range. I mean, his talent extended so many different ways. Uh, it's really kind of kind of staggering. And this one particularly got me. I'm sorry, the one on the right is a little blurry, but you know, here's a little game. Which is the Kafka and which is the James Thurber? I mean, and the Thurber isn't probably for 20 or 30 years. Thurber's living in Columbus, maybe in New York at the time. Look at the Kafka. I mean, it's kind of extraordinary. And finally, uh, there are the two of them again. And as the skeleton says, uh, now if you excuse me, I've got to get back to work and there's uh, sort of an image from the thing. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing the screen. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah very, very interesting, very <clears throat> powerful, really powerful. Um, uh, Stanley, um, I, I have a question, maybe it's more for you. Let's see if we can have uh, Professor Korngold to rejoin us. So now we can talk, right? Yes, I don't see you, but I can hear you. 
um so um ken touched on uh, what was happening in the world and I specifically i was curious how much kafka was aware of or influenced but what was happening in the german speaking world because think of it there was amazing year uh, in, in your talk you already talked about the psychoanalysis freud and jung are active during those uh, years but then quantum mechanics and relativity um, they come from the german speaking world uh, fregen and uh, hilbert in mathematics and uh, they revolutionized uh, mathematics uh, if we want to go to switzerland uh, dada hugo ball starts dada in uh, zurich um, visual arts um, I, I will mispronounce it, but their Blaue writer, mm -hmm. unique uh, expressionism. So, so was Kafka in any way, in any way, involved, influenced in all this major uh, upheaval, cultural upheaval that was going on in the German-speaking world? Um, of course, that is uh, ein weites Feld. That's a large topic. Um, more and more scholarship shows that Kafka was very much aware of uh, his own cultural milieu and indeed uh, the European cultural milieu. Uh, he was a great turner of pages of books. He would love to go to bookstores, right? And glance at one book after another. So the, the question is, um, how deeply did Kafka involve himself in issues to which he refers uh, allus allusively, right? So I think if you comb through his work, you would find allusions to the various uh, issues you, you mention, uh, but his deep, deep involvement is really with you know work and his agonizing struggle with his fiancée uh, and his writing. Um, uh, yeah, I, that, I would. Yeah. yeah, I'm so sorry. I, no, I just want to add one other, one quick thing. Um, Ken's wonderful talk um, mentioned the house Fanta, where uh, there it can be presumed Einstein and Kafka were together in the same room, and along with. Uh, Rilke at one point, and along with Walter Benjamin at one point. So at, at the House Fanta, he would hear lectures about the issues that you describe, but especially philosophical matters um, and questions, sure, of logic and above all, you know, issues of sense perception and empiricism and what was going on epistemo in epistemology in at the various uh, German and French and so sorry, and Prague universities. Um, his feelers were out. Uh, he alludes to it in, right, an immense range of issues. But as I suggested, his deep, deep involvement is with himself and those immediate personal bonds and his effort to let his dreamlike inner life come out. I, um, I, I, I'm so sorry to go on and on. I just, I just one thing I fear I must tell Ken. Ken, that was really a wonderful talk. And since you mentioned uh, Dagid Kafka, there goes Kafka. Uh, I'd like to just cite an anecdote that not many people have heard quickly, and it's appropriate to our topic, which includes the media. So um, in that book by Utsi Deal, you may remember this or know it, um, Utsi Deal wanders through Prague dragging a cart, and on the cart is an enormous instrument. And what is it? Kafka sees it and says, what is that thing? And he says, oh, it's an, an, an enlarger. And Kafka said, enlarger, what do you mean? And he said, well, says Utsidia, I take photographs and then I enlarge them. Oh, said Kafka, and well, whom do you photograph? And Utsidia said, oh, you know, my sister and my father. And Kafka said, and you want to enlarge them? Mm -hmm. That's the story. Well, I, you know, Stanley, <laughs> thank you. I mean, it, I, I, it, it, it's not a surprise that Kafka suffered from insomnia. It's probably one of the great benefits of insomnia ever 
ever in human history because I cannot believe the amount of life that he packed into those two years. Right. Um, in addition to that, um, as I'm sure you know, Hans Zischler did a book and uh, you know, here's a little bit of a uh, shout out. He actually translated my Hannah Arendt book in Germany, but this is not to give Hans any props, but he did a book called Kafka Goes to the Movies. Right. Where he detailed what a what a uh, in kind of involved and intensive moviegoer uh, Kafka was. I mean, he kept you know he kind of went to every movie that he could see and really responded to them. Kafka, there are I was trying to just also in this respond to some surprising parts about Kafka's narrative. The fact that he was a vegan, you know, he was a a, a, a lap swimmer. Um, he. Uh, he and Broad, you know, could have been a joke, but, you know, I think when I was in my 20s, I went with a friend and traveling around Europe and said, let's write a, let's write a, you know, he could have written the first Europe on $20 a day. I think he and Max Broad tried to do that as a joke or seriously. Right. So there are aspects. And the other thing, you know, the stories that we, I always thought were kind of strange that the first time he read The Judgment or the first time he read The Metamorph, he, he was laughing, he was cackling wait these this is kafka this is not he, and and then re-looking re at his work it's very very funny i mean i think there's an element of, of like you were speaking about a report to the academy and this made me think of the insurance writings that you know if you just look at this is i guess the muir translation honored members of the academy exclamation mark you know you have done me the honor of inviting me to give your academy an account of the life I formerly led as an ape. I mean, you're right. diving in deep with the with the humorous premise there, or or tragic, or whatever. But, um, you know, I I just think that for whatever reason, he was just exploding with with creativity. And and it's interesting to hear you say he was flipping through books in bookstores because, um. You know, also at this time, he became fascinated with the whole Jewish thing. And I think he read like I was reading some sort of massive thousand page history of the Jews. And um, so, you know, we're and, 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 and working hard in the insurance uh, office. So uh, and and of course, you know, it, exercising his genius um, of trying to do something, I think, with literature which just breaks the boundaries talking about, you know, multimedia or whatever, you know, interdisciplinary. I mean, I think what he was trying to do with writing was if, if he could have had hands, literal human hands come out of the page and grab the reader and shake them. I think that is what, you know, he was trying to do. That's how I interpret it. Okay. I think uh, time to, to move to Claire. Thank you very much. I, maybe we'll have more thoughts. Uh, after Claire's uh, talk. Claire, um, let me introduce you a little more than with the one sentence I had before. Uh, media artist uh, Claire Pentecost, the professor emeritus at the Art Institute of Chicago, has been exhibited and lectured internationally. I confess I was not familiar with her work until a common friend introduced me to her soil uh, erg project uh, which considers the material of soil as the basis for an alternative economic system. And that took me to her interest in nature and artific artificiality, uh, focusing on food, soil, and bioengineering. Uh, she even had a project titled Proposal for a New American Architecture and uh, um, Agriculture. And um, she has a project uh, uh, in which she collected soil samples to be used for experiments in soil uh, chromatography. Uh, I find that fascinating, but of course we don't have time to talk about everything. Anyway, a uh, very distinguished and, and a varied uh, uh, career. Okay, the podium is yours. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kill my mm. video and my, and my audio. Thank you so much, uh, Pierre and um, Ken and Stanley. Um, it's a real treat for me to be here. It's off my beaten track, I must say. I am the outlier here. 
Um, I'm not a Kafka scholar. Uh, I found out about this panel. I was invited about a week ago. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just try to give you a little bit of a perspective on Kafka from an artist's point of view. And we're going to, this will be in three parts. And I will look at some works that have been done by artists uh, in response to Kafka. Then I will show you some of my work which has been called Kafka-esque, and you can decide about that. And then I will read a poem that I wrote um, taking off from one of my favorite lines by Kafka. I read Kafka when I was um, quite young, and I assume it has colored my view of uh, culture, the individual in society, and um, many other things. I'm going to uh, see if I can share my screen here because I have uh, some visuals. Um, okay, let's, here we go. Okay. Um, last week, uh, Pierre asked me for a title, and I came up with Kafka, The Comfortless Muse. Um, in some ways, I mean, I think Kafka often embodies contradictions. Um, and on the one hand, you would think this is, he's a very uh, unsentimental, uh, a very comfortless kind of vision of the world. Um, and family dynamics, especially. Um, but if you feel alienated from your society, um, you might take comfort in, in Kafka's vision so that uh, you don't feel so alone. Like many artists I know, I was very uh, alienated from my culture and society when I was young, by which I mean that everything seemed very strange to me. Um, and Kafka was like a companion because his view was a kind of kaleidoscope of strangeness um, and distanciation from the usual um, salvos about human existence. Um, so I'm going to show you a few works by artists. This is by the artist uh, Martin Kippenberger. He's been dead for about 10 years. Uh, he's a German artist, died at the age of around 50 um, because he was known as a kind of bad boy in the art world. And um, lived very hard years, uh, drinking and smoking and staying up late and causing a ruckus. And this is considered his masterpiece. Um, he, he was very varied. What you're looking at is his rendition of, it's called, um, what is it called? Uh, the Happy Ending of Kafka's America. So we're talking about Kafka's last unfinished novel, um, America, which is hilarious. Um, it's, it's, it's such a surreal take on the US and it has very uncanny perception about um, American society, even though Kafka had never been there. Um, but what you're looking at, okay, so I'll remind you in the last chapter, the ending of America, um, the protagonist, Carl, who has come from the old country and was a stoker on a steamship coming across the Atlantic, landing in New York, and then he has proceeds to have many adventures in the mythical land of America. And the last scene, he goes to um, 
something like a large recruitment center. He's seen posters advertising uh, positions with the Oklahoma Nature Theater, the largest theater in the world. Everyone is welcome. There's a place for everyone. Um, but it's basically a job interview. And so Kippenberger has taken this motif. Um, now the PR company, the, the publicity team of the Oklahoma Nature Theater um, has a big presentation of women dressed as angels standing on pillars and um, playing trumpets, which we'll get to in a minute. But um, what Kippenberger seems to have um, focused on is this setup, this kind of dispositif of the job interview. So he has all these kind of chairs and tables, and a lot of them are ludicrous. Um, it's a very large installation. In the back, you can see bleachers because the first time it was shown, people were allowed to walk in, sit on the chairs, uh, climb the ladders, et cetera. Um, but they they decided that the, it really couldn't take that wear and tear, so they set up bleachers. This, this piece has shown in many locales in Europe and the US. Um, and it's kind of like he set up this job interview recruitment center, kind of like an obstacle course of absurd furniture. Um, let's look at a couple of more shots of this. Um, you can see some of the, and Kippenberger would work with things that he made, things that he found, things that he bought or stole or borrowed from friends. And so we get this kind of collage um, this one is particularly fanciful. And it, I think it really captures this, this idea of America as a place of labor, opportunity, entertainment, fun. Um, and here's a view. This is where I saw it in 1999 at the Carnegie, um, International, big show um, that happens periodically in Pittsburgh at the Carnegie Institute. Um, so let's see who else. Um, okay, so this is a, a photograph by the photographer Jeff Wall, who is known for elaborate construction setups to make very banal scenes that have an uncanny kind of mood. Um, and this one is called Odra Deck, which you may remember from um, Kafka's story, The Cares of a Family Man. And he talks about this kind of creature that is um, very strange and hides out under the stairs and is always fleeting. And it's... Um, it's kind of like the presence of, you could call it the unconscious, dread, um, haunting. And so this is Jeff Wall's imagination of the setting for that story. And here you can see in this uh, little circle where he has placed the Odra deck, which uh, Kafka describes quite literally, and here is a picture of Jeff Wall's Odra Jack, which was like a wheel with threads and, and a perpendicular arm and another and a foot. Um, so uh, this is one artist's imagination of something very, a very literal interpretation of a Kafka story and some of its attributes. Uh, this is another picture by Jeff Wall, which I thought I would throw in because it's called Insomnia. And um, once again, the, the whole picture has been set up. I mean, in fact, 
he probably had this kitchen constructed um, to make the picture that he wanted to make. Um, and I think you might call it kind of Kafkaesque. Um, Warhol included Kafka in his 10 portraits of Jews of the 20th century. We have uh, Gertrude Stein, Martin Buber, Einstein. Oh, let me come back to him. Um, Gershwin, the Marx Brothers, Golda Meir, Sarah Bernhardt, Freud. Who is that? I'll remember in a minute. Um, but Kafka is the one portrait from this series that has really taken its place among the celebrity icons that um, Warhol was captivated by. And I think it's just a testament to how even people who haven't read Kafka have heard of Kafka-esque, um, which is something we can discuss. This is another work also responding to Kafka's novel, America. This was made by Tim Rollins and his group of protégés called Kids of Su Survival. And what they would do, if you can see here, what you're seeing is a grid of pages of the novel. And they have done this intervention of painting and this is very large. This is this would probably be about 10 feet um, long, wide. Um, and he's taken the motif or this group. Okay, so Tim Rollins works with very uneducated Bronx students um, who, and he trained them to be artists. And they spent a lot of time with Tim Rollins reading to this group because they were barely literate. And then they contemplated uh, these famous works um, and made pictures. Um, here's another one. Um, there, It's a series, this is done in the mid eighties. And uh, this is in the collection of the Chase Manhattan Bank um, where you can see the this kind of delirium of these trumpets and horn-like, um, almost biomorphic, almost like stomachs and intestines, um, which is a very interesting kind of place for Kafka to go. Um, okay, switching now to some of my own work to give you um, Give you an idea of why I'm here. This is the drawing I made that Caroline Jones, Caroline A. Jones, the art historian at MIT, um, who knows my work and suggested me to Pierre for this occasion, um, based on this drawing, which she considered um, haunting of Kafka. And you can see. Um, it's, and I'm gonna give you the context for this, but I just wanna show you, I have Kafka. This is a proposal for a currency note. And I'll explain that in a minute, but you see the burrow back here. And here's Red Peter. Um, and one of his quotes, uh, everyone who walks this earth feels a tickling at his heels. Now, this was part of a larger work about soil. And I love this quote, um, which is basically saying, uh, there's something in the earth that prevails on us ultimately to be returned to the earth. And this is the larger frame for this ape that you've already heard a little bit about this story, a report to an academy of Red Peter was an ape who learned human language and became uh, 
the equivalent of the average cultured European, as it says in this story. Um, so I wanted to, this was back in 2011, I wanted to make a work about the elevated um, good soil and sort of pronounced the value of soil. And at the time, I could only find two other works that dealt with soil. This is Newton Harrison, who made soil in the 1970. And this is Walter de la Maria, um, de Maria at the Dia Foundation called Earth Room, where he simply filled a room with earth. You can go see it in Soho, New York right now. Um, but, and every year they take it all out and sterilize it and put it back. So this is not the kind of soil I'm talking about. I'm talking about healthy living soil that um, is the alternative to using chemicals in agriculture. So what I decided to do was introduce a, an economy based on healthy soil, that that would be, you know, like not the gold standard, but the soil standard. And I call this unit of economy soil erg because it's made of soil and work, hence erg. And I researched different forms for currency. The coin form was very common, very ancient. Um, but also I borrowed the form of the ingot, um, because, which is, you know, a form to store precious metals. Um, and this is how I displayed them. I made ingots out of compost and soil and I displayed them on a gilded glass so that uh, it was immediately legible. Like you saw the gold, you saw the shape, but it's reversed. Um, and this is the installation at the Documenta 13 in Kassel, Germany in 2012. And as you can see, I have a whole suite of drawings. There were 43 drawings originally. And the way I did the drawings, I decided to put on the currency of the Soilergs, um, people, first I started making drawings of people who had contributed to a more ecological understanding of agriculture. So this is, uh, J. Irving Rodale of the Rodale Institute, early proponent of organic agriculture. And then I dipped the drawings in a slurry of compost and soil because I wanted that materiality. I was very interested in materializing the sign. And so these are some of the people I first drew, Lady E. Balfour, uh, Sir Howard, um, Kutsera, a root specialist, and here is Rachel Carson, making us realize that the poisons we put into the earth when we grow our food are obviously killing everything, including the birds. Um, then I started to add people who have shifted the human um, have kind of decentered the human in the broader ecology so that the human is not such a special transcendent category. Um, so we have a Darwin here. Down here is um, Donna Haraway, the biologist and philosopher who's talked a lot about companion species, Lynn Margulis, who changed the, her whole understanding of evolution. And here is where I put Kafka and Red Peter. So what I'm interested in, oh, by the way, I then made currency notes with the creatures of the soil food web. Um, but so what I'm interested in is Kafka's use of animals in his fiction. And I'm sure the scholars here, Dr. Korngold and um, Ken too has done so much research 
Um, yeah, I'm sure you have opinions on what Kafka's doing as he uses animals to to populate, to be the protagonist of so many of his stories. But in my sense of it, in my interpretation, I feel like Kafka is cultivating an outsider's view, a kind of exteriority where we can see the human, humans as animals, um, which is a device for kind of um, expressing an alienation. Um, and, you know, historically, this is a time where it, you could say the beginning of humanism, we have Freud's Copernican revolution, et cetera, um, Darwin, Einstein, and um, where we're starting to understand ourselves in different ways. Now, I was just going to give you one more. Um, this is a series I did of my more recent, my most recent work, um, which I feel like very much relates to Kafka and his kind of Ovidian metamorphosis of the human and the non-human. And this is a project I've made, a suite of photographs called Linnaeus After Dark. And I'm just gonna run through them and tell you the titles. These are creatures I've made and lit and photographed. And this one is called The Comedian. By the way, I think Kafka's really funny. Um, this one is called DJ Carboniferous. Buffalo Rome. Oh, wow. Republic. The Nearness of the Other. Self-Portrait with Human. Secret Knowledge. Minimal Ontology. Reluctant Shamanism. Alien Superstar. Reciprocal Capture. Stowaways. After Party. Settler Colonial. The Innocent. Mother. Girl Sleuth. Ritual Evaluation. Pioneer Cemetery. What is it like to be a bat? Philosophers ask. Expectation. The crows. So um, I actually went through these and um, paired them with different aphorisms from of Kafka's, but I I declined to to put them together in the end because this is the book edited, introduced, and with commentaries by Reiner Stock, 
and translated by Shelley Frisch. But I feel like the aphorisms, they're, they're not the Kafka I most relate to. They are rarely humorous in my estimation. Um, so I will just, uh, maybe I'll just close here. Um, I, I haven't been keeping time, but I don't want to um, abuse you. With, no. uh, it's, with a, it's, a, it's a very interesting perspective and uh, I value it. <clears throat> I wanted somebody like you uh, precisely because Kafka today transcends what he really was. Uh, in fact, I, I have a question for uh, all of you, Ken and uh, Stanley, if you can rejoin, uh, uh, because this is a question in general. When, when I was asking Stanley about Kafka's fortune, when did he become famous and so on, uh, in, in, in my mind, I was really thinking that we, we really identify more uh, with this uh, bureaucratic world. You know that we 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 have all been uh, uh, K is the protagonist of uh, um, which one the castle I think Joseph K is the protagonist of the trial. We've all been that person because we live uh, uh, in the age of these vast bureaucracies, um, and I think it really started. Uh, there were already bureaucracies uh, certainly in the Austrian-Hungarian. Uh, Empire, but I think from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you've had this escalating uh, process of uh, bureaucratizing the world, uh, democracy, communism, whatever. That's, you know, and, and now increasingly these bureaucracies as, are algorithmic, which even in, increases the distance between you and the bureaucrat. Now the bureaucrat is an algorithm, you know. Um, so we've all had episodes where we couldn't fight. We couldn't prove we're innocent. You know, that's a parking ticket I was given in East Palo Alto it was unfair. I know I was innocent. There was no way to prove it, you know. So is it is it possible that Kafka's fortune transcends his merit? I mean, he was a great writer. He had an incredible imagination and, and so on. But also... He didn't know, but he's talking about me. He's talking about you. He's talking really about the world that then, then really, uh, that became our reality, not hallucination, just daily life. Well, if I mean, I'll jump in. Claire, the stuff was like amazing, and I think just the perspectives that everybody put in uh, on it today is shows that. I mean, I would think that somehow if something is great art, it speaks to every time and every element of human condition. I mean, I don't really know why Shakespeare wrote Macbeth, but I know it still resonates. Um, and I think Kafka's work, yeah, I mean, I think maybe in the 60s or in the 20th century or whatever, you know, there is that element of bureaucratic futility, but there's also the humor. There's also the the longing there's also i mean it just yeah. Hannah, the quote that i really value from hannah rent uh about storytelling where she says storytelling um storytelling reveals meaning without uh committing the error of defining it and i think you know that's what um art does when it's on the level of kafka uh i think I mean, look at the look at the responses the three of us gave to it, and, and the artists that you showed. So, I think everybody makes their own, hopefully, reality out of it. But I think Kafka is singularly modern, um, you know, because because of the. Um, the alienation introduced by industrialization and bureaucracy and, um, you know, large entities and logistics, which treat people as uh, parts of a machine, right? So I think um, Kafka is particularly relevant 
to us because the world has been catching up to him and then exceeding him as Pierre was mentioning. Right, you put it in uh, beautiful words. <clears throat> yeah, The world has been catching up with him, <clears throat> yes. Okay, um, so we got one comment to make. Oh, yes. sorry. Stanley, this matter. Um, once you make a, a, a proposition, state of proposition about what Kafka mainly says, uh, and then you look more closely at the text, you see he's also saying something like the opposite. Uh, this isn't to dispute. It's in fact to affirm what um, Ken was just saying um, and Claire as well about his richness and complexity. There's no end to it. There's no end to this um, non-dialectical closure. <clears throat> if I could just jump on, I mean, Kafka predicted chat GPT. I mean, how did he know about that? We're just figuring it out, but he knew it. There's gonna be machines that basically think for you and all of us. How did he know there, that? There's a project out right now. <laughs> You're, oh, Ken, you might like to contribute. It is Kafka and AI. Yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, an invitation to send in essays on this topic to an important journal. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing uh, about the complexity and both sides of things. Um, the one proposition is we are tormented by bureaucracy, we're innocent. The other side of things is that he holds Joseph K., Joseph, not to be innocent at all, um, and colludes in his own uh, murder at the end. Um, he's, in, he's involved in this because what's stated throughout the work is that the end result of the, of the process the procedure, the trial, um, is uh, a, a matter of the way in which the accused has conducted his own defense. Right? So we don't even get clear. <laughs> we can't confidently state Kafka's position on bureaucracy without also noting that Kafka described himself as the most bureaucratic of human beings that in his fundamental being, he was more a bureaucrat than any other kind of essential figure, etc. This capacity to be on both sides at all times is astonishing, but it also uh, keeps us <laughs> reading Kafka, right? We're desperate to find the one proposition that will stand firm and so far not, and the game, the enterprise, uh, what someone has called the dangerous enterprise uh, continues and it's exciting. Wonderful. Okay. Any final comments? <clears throat> Claire, you have a question about your art, but I think I want you back to talk just about your art and you will ask questions about your projects. Um, any final thought about uh, Kafka? Um, I just want to, I'm sorry. I, I just want to respect the person who asked me this question and um. I uh, tell, is it Naresh? Yes. Um, tell Naresh to um, to email me. I'll put my email in the chat. I'm happy to talk more about um, about whatever questions you have. Um, Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, this was uh, fascinating, very educational. And um, I think I was right to put together three completely different perspectives. And rather than having three literary critics talk about Kafka, I think this gave us uh, an interesting, multiple, multidimensional view of things. Okay, that's our humble contribution to the <clears throat> to the centennial. Thank you very much, and um, I hope to meet in person with you uh, someday. It's a, it's a pity to uh, to to not have time to socialize in person after these events. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. And sorry I kept you so long. Usually we don't go this far, but you can imagine to, today was really was really exciting. Thank you. Have a good day thank you. or a good evening. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye, both. It was wonderful. Flourish. <laughs>